Welcome to a new edition of Echo Africa. This week, we'll be taking another look at the impact oil drilling has on the environment. My name is Chris Alems, coming to you from Nigeria. And with me, as always, is my co-host from Uganda. Hi, everybody. I am Sandra Twinovidio here in Kampala, Uganda. Happy to have you with us again. And we hope you get inspired with new environmental topics from Europe and Africa. Here is what is coming up shortly this week. How the sun's power can be used to roast coffee beans. Why insects are an eco-friendly and delicious food source. And how mobile technology helps farmers in Ghana protect their animals from disease. Our first report focuses on a controversial issue of the coast of South Africa. Oil giant Shell plant to conduct a series of seismic surveys in search of oil and gas reserves of the country's coastline. But a South African court put a temporary hold to the testing. Now, while environmentalists uphold the decision, they know the battle is not yet over since a final ruling in the case is still pending. <laughs> Subsistence fisher Siabonga Ndovela has managed well till now, but the future is less certain. He's concerned about the seismic testing for oil and gas that the Shell company has been performing along South Africa's coastline. During the process, shockwaves are blasted into the water 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to locate pockets of oil and gas beneath the ocean floor. Even if it takes place 20 kilometers offshore, Dovela is worried about the impact it could have on local marine life and livelihoods. Once Chell um, come to the ocean and do the blasting and find oil, then our lives will be finished. Our food will be gone. The sea lives will be finished. So we're more connected to the ocean. We do many different ways. So we're really, really worried um, that if the government pushes this and not listening our voice and our pain and our worry, then our identity will be, will be, will be gone. The government, both national and local, initially supported the surveying, saying it would create jobs and help develop the area. It would also significantly reduce the need for oil and gas imports. But since COP26, many in South Africa think that there are larger, more long-term concerns to consider. As people are dependent on the environment for food, for livelihood, um, we are dependent on the environment and climate change impacts us. Why should, at this point in time, our country be going into a trajectory that is going to increase the carbon emission? We are very concerned and we hope they would wake up to that and be able to be held accountable to their commitment to, um, to, 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 to reducing carbon emission. While surveys have been proposed for a number of spots along the coast, the site in question is a 6,000 square kilometer area near virtually untouched wilderness. Dive operator Rob Nettleton has lived here for over a decade. He feels the natural environment, which gave the wild coast its name, it's not being taken into account. The seismic testing, in my opinion, is not the biggest threat. It does have an influence and we still, and none of the scientists out there still know what the effects are on our marine environment. But this has been going on since the late 19, or since the 1950s. The bigger concern is what will happen after the seismic testing, should they find oil or gas reserves here. The potential with the freak wave phenomena, as well as the strength of the current here, for an oil rig to be capsized or to be dislo dislodged from its position, which in turn will create an oil spill, is huge. It's huge and it's very concerning. The testing was slated for a part of the ocean frequented by whales and dolphins. Conservationists have raised concerns that the relentless noise created by the blasting could harm marine life. A review found that in nearly 75% of cases, marine animals were negatively affected by underwater waves and noise. 
everything from migratory whales to the smallest plankton, the bears of the food chain, and including the species Novella and his community rely on. Um, my big hope for this coastline, for me, for my kids, for my sons, um, for the community, is to protect this, this coastline as it is and benefits for my kids as I do now and benefits for my community and benefits for everyone that got a relationship with the ocean. In December 2021, a South African court ruled that Shell had to stop all explorations for the time being, a decision shared by local communities. But the reason the court halted the operation was that the company had failed to carry out the full required consultations. There are several other farms with exploration permits, so the people here may still have to fight to preserve and protect their coastlines. And now to the coffee lovers. Italy is called Europe's coffee capital. So I wonder what Italians would say if they knew that their beloved espresso beans had been roasted without using a traditional energy source. It is another clever innovation for a segment doing a bit. This is a solar power plant with a twist. The energy from sunlight roasts coffee beans. Mirrors concentrate the sun's rays on a rotating drum filled with fresh beans. Autonomous sensors help to adjust the mirrors according to the sun's position. All the mechanics are powered with solar energy. So the beans are roasted without fossil fuels. An environmentally friendly cup of joe. It's pure concentrated solar energy that roasts the bean. No fuel consumption, which means zero CO2 emissions. Nowadays, this is an important issue for many people. The co-founders spent almost six years developing the solar roasting machine. The largest model can roast up to 200 kilograms of coffee a day. The technology saves 400 kilos of CO2 emissions per tonne of roasted coffee. An espresso made with renewable energy seems feasible. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. If human beings don't change their eating habits, researchers predict that we'll soon need additional farmland that is twice the size of India to produce enough food for everyone. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yes, Sandra, especially since nature offers an alternative. Eat more insects is the mantra of a scientist from Zimbabwe. He thinks that the agri-food sector has to be reconsidered and explains why in his own cookbook, Bon Appetit. What many find creepy is pure gold to Kilian Ruzande. The 30-year-old teaches farmers in Zimbabwe how to turn their waste into resources, as at this pig waste dump on a farm near Harare. And insects like these black soldier fly larvae make potent animal feed for free. Pupa or a thousand pre-pupa like these ones that you've just harvested there in the dirt, you can sell them 50 US dollars. So to me, uh, this is money. To me, this is life, yes. And as nature does it, as it's been recycled, we are going to get some manure there that we're going to be putting in our garden. So nature doesn't waste anything. To me, there's nothing that, that is called waste. At the Chinhoi University of Technology, entomologist Robert Musundire and his colleagues prepare a unique cooking class. They have created, then published, several insect dishes in a cookbook. The Zimbabwean Broadcast Corporation produces a cooking show thanks to the book. The hope is that the recipes can be used as a marketing strategy that popularizes bugs as environmentally friendly ingredients. 
They also have iron, a very rich source of iron. For several years, studies have been conducted at the small university. The entomologist looks at different insect species that are suitable for human consumption and ways to prepare them. His view is that insects can become an affordable and accessible source of protein in Zimbabwe, where six million people are malnourished. We have done a lot of studies uh, with a variety of insect species that are edible. We found out that in terms of uh, the protein content, it ranges from 30% to uh, around uh, 69% on dry matter basis. Then we go on uh, antioxidants. We are quite excited. Our studies have shown that termites, uh, and as well as the edible stink bugs, they have high levels of antioxidants. But stink bugs and termites are not usually seen as delicacies, and many people are averse to eating insects. But now there are around 40 species that have been classified as edible for humans. Um, I used not to eat these uh, edible insects because I didn't know about them. I didn't know how, how to prepare them. I didn't know what, they, what value they are to us. And um, because uh, even my parents did not even uh, bring them to the table. So we're now trying to make sure we're bringing them to the table. But buying edible insects can be difficult. Most are poached in the wild and sold informally and only in season. Insects can be bred, but without a formal market, farmers who do so are scarce. With the Chinhoi Edible Insects Market, the first of its kind in Zimbabwe, Robert Musundire and the Swedish International Development Cooperation, AgriFosa, have created retail and storage space for three female traders to sell insects year-round. So what we are saying here is we, we want to prolong the shelf life, we want to maintain quality, we want to promote food safety. So this facility really provides uh, those attributes to our product. As you can see, they also have an opportunity to package into, into, into small plastics. We are already eliminating food contaminants. Musundire views this market as the first seed planted in the creation of a formal value chain for edible insects in Zimbabwe. It's a small start and there are still few clients, but shopkeepers who started just a few weeks ago are optimistic that business will soon pick up. Most people like insects. They like them very much. So business of insects is a good business. Back on the farm, Ruzande builds a black soldier fly breeder. He believes that insect farming is a good business idea because insects make very efficient livestock and have minimal environmental impact. Producing one kilogram of beef requires about 16,000 liters of water. Creating the same amount of cricket protein would only need 100 liters. Insects for human consumption that is uh, a project that I'm actually also working on, uh, a project that uh, involves uh, crickets and some of our indigenous uh, locusts. So I see profits and money here. Yeah. Although insect animal feed production was largely unknown in Zimbabwe just a few years ago, it's starting to take hold. The same could happen with edible insects for human consumption, especially if it makes environmental and business sense. Mmm, I just might give one of those recipes a try someday soon. That looked pretty good. But back to Europe now, where Germany's woodlands are under severe strain. Trees are dying at an alarming rate. International researchers are on a mission to reverse the trend, and we accompanied some of them on one of their trips to the forest. The woodland equivalent of a stethoscope. Here, in one of the warmest areas in Germany, researchers are taking the pulse of the country's forests. Today I want to test uh, how the, this beech tree sapling um, is responding to different light intensities and also to uh, simulate it um, enriched CO2, which very likely will be there in the future. Therefore, it is very important for us to know when this sapling is growing on the soil, whether it, is, it has enough water to do that level of photosynthesis. 
Indian-born researcher Samit Saha has put together a team of young scientists from various countries and disciplines. The group are called Sylvanus, after the ancient Roman god of the woodlands. And worldwide, Samit Saha sees those woodlands under threat, also from sprawling urbanization and rapid population growth, including in his native India. Plantations and the tea plantation, coffee plantation, or eucalyptus plantation, or acacia plantations, or rubber plantations, these are increasing. And uh, government sometimes also consider plantations as a forest. So you can see that sometimes you say, oh, we have 21% forest in India, and that's a huge amount compared if you look the size of India. But out of this 21%, um, there are huge amount of plantations, and the high quality forest which can provide habitat to to uh, endangered tree species like tiger or other animals is actually low. Active deforestation to make way for farmland and timber production is one reason for the large-scale loss of woodlands. And then there is climate change, which has taken a heavy toll on our forests, here in Germany too. According to a government study, the proportion of unhealthy trees in the country has risen to 80%. And that, in turn, makes them vulnerable to pests, such as the bark beetle. Normally, bark beetle is a part of our ecosystem. They are always there. But nowadays, they are uh, kind of um, destroying so many trees because trees are actually weakened first by drought. And then, when someone is already weakened, then the vulnerability to disease will be uh, increased. And that's uh, like human, it's the same in the trees. Germany is home to almost 12 million hectares of woodland, two-thirds of which are used by the timber industry. Spruce, pine and beech trees are grown in monocultures, trees that are particularly susceptible to drought conditions. The researchers are planting new saplings in an attempt to keep tree mortality in check. The tree species also has a capacity to, to evolve. If you take out completely from the system, then you can lose the species. But at the same time, you should try with the species which are maybe new to this environment, but not invasive. Native trees are being rapidly and permanently displaced by invasive species, such as this poisonous perennial plant, American pokeweed. So how can researchers find out which non-native species can be planted in German forests without endangering them? The landscape gardens of Karlsruhe Palace feature trees from all corners of the planet, many of them over 200 years old. My recommendation is that we can try to study the exotic species which are already here for centuries, rather than you know, bringing some new tree species from anywhere in the world and plant them. The American red oak, for example, has integrated perfectly in Central Europe. It copes well with heat, drought and rising concentrations of CO2 and it's adapted to local conditions without displacing native species. Here the red oak somehow get adapted to the new condition. So when you, and that went to one direction that they can actually survive under shade. And there, so the red oak here is are also growing faster. In this commercial timber forest, American red oaks were planted among European hornbeams. That competition has encouraged the oaks to grow quickly and relatively straight, resulting in exceedingly high quality timber. It's 10.5. Timber is actually a, a renewable resource and it is an eco-friendly resource. So we should have a goal that the requirement of the timber of our region should be fulfilled by the uh, trees which are cultivated in our region. Okay, the direction's correct. The researchers hope their work will foster a revival of Germany's ailing forests by mapping and measuring the way to greater resilience against climate change. And now from Germany back to Africa, namely the north of Ghana, where there are cattle ranches everywhere you look. But the ranchers there are dealing with a serious problem, climate change. Along with the more widely known issues, climate change is also making it easier for the new diseases to evolve. But a project aims to help farmers better protect their animals through the use of mobile technology. We paid them a visit to find out more. Now 
Fuseni Braima is worried. His family's cattle are not doing well. The animals have been searching for food for hours. But here, in the Savalugu district in northern Ghana, it's dry season. The grass has been scorched by the sun and good watering holes are a rarity. Like when you just open them from the house, the way they are moving, you yourself will suffer. And the cattle too, they will not get uh, eat like the rainy season. So this time they are not enjoying themselves. So the cattle are suffering for this time. But the animals may be more than exhausted and hungry. The herdsman fears they may also be sick. Climate change means that it's getting hotter and the cattle have to work farther to find food. That makes them susceptible to new diseases. Ghana's chief veterinarian, Dr. Bashir Kikimoto, works at the Animal Health Laboratory of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Government agencies have noticed that more and more livestock are becoming ill due to climate change. Now the rivers have run down in the volumes of water. Animals are forced to travel long distances looking for the water and they all drink from the same source. And then by converging, they bring the disease from one to the another, to move from one animal to another. Savalugu livestock market. Meat production is an important part of the economy, especially here in northern Ghana. But every year, farmers here lose about a quarter of their animals to diseases, such as the highly contagious bovine pleuropneumonia and the ovine rinderpest that can ravage sheep and goats. Many losses could be avoided, but there are not enough veterinarians in the country and far too little prevention through vaccines. The young Ghanaian startup Cow Tribe is currently trying to develop this potentially huge market. For five US dollars a year, the company registers farmers interested in veterinary services or products in a database. The farmers use their cell phones to sign up. Looking at the platform, you can see where groups of farmers are located. So we send messages to them and say, this is the time you should vaccinate your animals and all that. And when they respond, we know how much demand is in different locations. The company and the farmers work out an annual vaccination schedule together. The startup obtains the vaccines from distributors of the government. In the future, it plans to order from international manufacturers directly in order to obtain more favorable conditions. Vaccinations are scheduled for today in Savalugu, a village about 30 kilometers from the nearest cow tribe branch. The vet is employed by the company. Village representatives find out what the various farmers need and convey the information to the team when they arrive. Yakubu Idrisu's sheep are first up. They are vaccinated against ovine rinderpest. One ampoule is enough for several sheep. It costs around $10, which includes a 20% commission for cow tribe. For Yakubu Idrisu, it's worth the cost because more animals survive and he has significantly fewer financial losses. When your production is high, definitely you get more money, you sell out some. And then the way our animals were dying, they were nearly gone uh, extinct. So now we have more of them. Anytime we are in financial crisis, we resort to selling some of them. So it has impacted a lot economically for us. Over 7,000 farmers and their animals in northern Ghana are already among Cow Tribe's customers. They are always happy because we protect their animals against diseases. We train them, we impact knowledge on them, and it's so helpful. But Fuseni Brimer has not yet had his cattle vaccinated. He still wants to wait and see whether his neighbor's investments really pay off. 
We've run out of time this week, but I do hope you picked up some very helpful ideas and information from the program. I am Sandra Twinovio saying goodbye from Kampala here in Uganda. See you next week. Thank you, Sandra. If you want to know more about our Echo issues, follow us on our social media channels. All the best from me too. I am Chris Alem saying so long from Lagos, Nigeria. We'll be back again next week. Till then, bye-bye.